VIP family, welcome to the VIP Experience Podcast. And today, we are honored and privileged to be speaking with a very special guest who is with the New York Yankees organization. Ray yes, is also Ray. celebrating 50 years in Major League Baseball. And for those who don't know Ray, um, Ray is the community consultant for the New York Yankees. Um, and he is now celebrating his 50 years in the uh, Yankees. So congrats on that. Ray is also in the Latino Hall of Fame. He is um, also in the Ted Williams Hall of Fame. And he is an ambassador, very, very well respected all throughout the Major League Baseball. And he is also proli a prolific author. Um, he has a bunch of children's books as well as Yankee Miracles, a great, fantastic book that I do recommend reading. Um, so yeah, Ray has been a bad boy for the Yankees for the or he was a bat boy in the 70s and 80s. And we're very excited to have Ray on here. Thank you, Ray, for, for showing up. We appreciate you being here. Nice. nice to be on. I appreciate the time to talk to you guys a little bit, see what you guys are doing. For sure. So uh, yeah, tell them a little bit about uh, VIP Rips and what we do here. So Ray, basically we are a sports memorabilia auction company and we specialize in live breaks on digital platforms so we go live on apps called whatnot as well as fanatics live and essentially we just live sell auctions of a bunch of sports cards boxes and teams are either randomized or picked in a pick your team format and we pretty much just open the boxes and everybody's kind of gambling on hitting a nice card so when the nice rookie cards come out, our buyers who have spent some money with us, they get a chance to get really paid. Uh, we hit, I don't know if you've been watching a little bit of football, but we hit a CJ Stroud card uh, two nights ago. It's worth probably around twenty to $30,000. Wow. So it's kind of the kind of the, the field that we're, we're working in. And as we also have a baseball channel as well, we hit, well, I think this week, we hit a Jackson Holiday autograph number to five. So that's huge right now. Right. Uh, some Wyatt Langford stuff, uh, so stuff of that nature, but obviously we, there's a lot of vintage baseball, and that's where the the real hobby is. Um, I feel like for baseball, that's where the authentic hobby is. That's where a lot of the big guys would like to collect and like to buy. So definitely want to talk to you about your involvement in any sorts of sports memorabilia later on. But first of all, for somebody who's a viewer who doesn't know who you are, who doesn't know your affiliation with the Yankees, I kind of want you to just introduce yourself and tell the viewer a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your story with the New York Yankees. Uh, June 29th, 1973. I'm outside Yankee Stadium with some people, and that's when the era that the Bronx was burning. And we, we took it to the streets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we were doing graffiti outside of Wall at Yankee Stadium. All of a sudden, a car drives up to the sidewalk. Two guys jump out. Everybody scatters. I trip over one of the guys, and I'm caught. I'm taken to a holding cell, getting ready to tra be transported to the 44th precinct. And uh, while I was sitting in the cell, one guy says to the other guy, that's where he belongs. There's nothing that you can do for these people. Wow. And when, he's, when he said that, he didn't realize that he was doing the biggest favor in my life because the other guy heard that and said, give me the kid, give me the kid. And they took me out of the holding cell and they dragged me crazily into the Yankees locker room. And it was like walking into Oz because all I could see was the white uniforms all around me. And next to you know, the one guy that was annoyed for this for the guy saying what he said, said, give him a uniform. He's going to work off his damages. And so that night I was the bad boy for the New York Yankees. And the guy that did that for me was George Steinbrenner, the new owner of the Yankees that year. What a crazy then, story. That's how my life in this crazy, wonderful game started because I was a bad boy for a couple of years. And then I became, I was drafted in the second round by the Pittsburgh Pirates. So I played professional baseball for a minute. And then when I proved to America that I was a shitty hitter, 
I, I was back to working for the New York Yankees and I, I did everything from videotaping the players to working in the gym to finally I became a special assistant and the right hand man to the owner, George Steinbrenner. And I did that until the day that he died. But I also got to do because I was with some incredible players like the the guy that they called Mr. October in that era. Reggie Jackson, who he was Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan, if you know what I mean. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's that's where I learned about the whole memorabilia craze and all that, because he actually started it. Well, after Reggie hit the three home runs in the World Series, all of a sudden everybody wanted his spikes, his shoes, his jock strap, anything sure. that he could sure. wear, you know, and that's how that's really how it, it really got motivated, you know, going. You know, but before that, you naturally, you know, the Babe Ruth stuff was expensive and the Lou Gehrig, if you can get it, and Mickey Mantle and the Maggio. So, but that's that's been my life in a nutshell. And uh, because of Reggie Jackson, I ended up doing movies and doing commercials and doing some TV shows. So, I, you know, I've had a chance to live different cycles of life. Awesome. And when you when George stopped you right there while you're spray painting the side of Yankee Stadium, did you imagine that you would be in this position 50 years later? Like, did that cross your mind? What was? No, no, because in my house, there were seven boys. And of the seven boys, I'm the only one that didn't go to prison. Of the seven boys, I'm the only one that's alive today. So how could I think about anything other than that I was going to be going to jail? You understand? Sure. And so I automatically understood. It was at that moment that I actually be, truly believed in God because I knew that this wasn't an accident. Okay? This was a reality. This was something that was preordained. This is something that God put me in a mission because through the years, I go to hospitals, I go to schools, I talk to kids. Uh, I, I, I have literally been a part of saving lives, okay? Uh, and when a child dies, that death, uh, in essence, helps thousands of kids live because of the motivation that the doctors have in finding cures for certain things. So though they may not find a cure for a disease, they find medicine that keeps them alive longer. You understand what I'm saying? 100%. And so that's all the different variables of things that I have been involved with throughout these 50 some odd years. It's bigger than baseball, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. And when when George did you that favor, when the boss, he did you that favor in the prison, was that the first time that somebody had ever given you an opportunity like that? Is that the first time that somebody had helped you in a time where, I mean, you look like you're in a holding cell, obviously it just looked like an awful position. But the first time somebody really gave you something like that, an opportunity, and what did that mean to you? Well, the fact that, and this is the first time I'm actually admitting to this, about a month before I was going into a Woolworths. Do they even still have Woolworths now? That, that was like a, a little department store and I was caught stealing. And so as I was walking out, the security grabbed me and I remember getting into a vicious fist fight so that I could get away and run. And the sickness of I was, what I was going through was I was happy because I escaped. You understand what I'm saying? That was the end. Yeah, no, 100%. And after George, the boss, had given you that opportunity, I mean, I know everyone knows him as being tough on his players, being tough around the people around him. Um, but he seemed to have a soft spot for you in his heart, and he seemed to have a soft spot for a bunch of kids. Would you be able to expand on what that was like and seeing him uh, open up to you and those around him? Well, the thing about George Steinbrenner was that he was, um, 
he was really, really tough on people that came of money that already had it, that think they had it made. But then with the lesser, he was always willing to help them. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, one time there was a bunch of kids outside the stadium and I would see them consistently. And then one day I went up to them and I said, you guys, have you guys ever been inside the stadium? And they said, no, we can't afford it. So I started to sneak them into the park wow. and put them, put them in the upper deck because the upper deck was empty. And one day uh, a security guard that was trying to score points with Mr. Steinbrenner said, hey, Ray Negron is sneaking his friends into the upper deck. So Steinbrenner said, get his ass in here right now. And so the guy got me and the guy was like happy that he had caught me, you know, you know, real kiss ass. Yeah. Kissing up, kissing up. So he took me in to see to Steinbrenner and then the, Mr. Steinbrenner says, I got it from here, Pat. Thank you. Good job. And then he turns to me, he says, how many kids? I said, 12. And he went into his pocket and gave me 200 bucks. And like in 1978, 200 bucks was a lot of money. And so he said, get them hot dogs and Cokes and buy them some caps and whatever they need. If you, if you run out of money, come on back. And then as I was walking out, he said, Ray, why didn't you tell me that you were sneaking the kids in? You know I was I was gonna let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> he knew. I said because they're not affiliated with anybody. They're not a part of the boys and girls club or anything like that. And so then he said, "F labels. They're human beings, and if they don't have the money to come into the park, we'll get them in the park anyway." Wow, that's awesome. He, said, he says. Horse, you were horse crap for sneaking them in and not telling me, but you did a great job today. I'm proud of you. Is that goodwill that he showed? Is that something now that you carry on as his legacy with the New York Yankees very to good. this day? Very good. I, I, I'm proud of you because that's why I do it. I, I, I work every day like he's in back of me watching. You know what I'm saying? I think it's awesome to have to have that as somebody to look up to as a figure and then to be able to use his values and his morals and to help guide you as well in your day to day as you kind of walk not the same path as him, but walk in a similar path. You're walking around the same areas and dealing with some of the things day to day that the Yankees had to deal with as well. So I think that's awesome to see that his aura and his energy and all that is still with the New York Yankees today. Well, I, I work every day, like I said, like he's still here, you know, because I have some haters who like to s remind me that he's dead. And every time that one of the haters says that to me, it only juices me up more. 100 percent. Yeah, of course. You understand what I'm saying? Because who are they? You understand? Who yeah. are they? So, no, please. Please keep reminding me so that, in essence, I can take it to the next level. I love it. I, I love really to hear do. that. Do you have any stories that you would share maybe about um, anyone who you were close with grew or uh, in the 70s and 80s with um, the Yankees roster? Um, just, I don't know, just something that maybe people can get, um, understand like what it was like in the 70s and 80s. Not only in the Bronx, or not only in the Yankee Stadium, but like maybe in the Bronx or growing up. Well, you know, growing up again, like I said at the beginning, uh, you can watch all these different documentaries, and when you talk about the seventies, you you always hear about the Bronx was burning, and that's because of all the different buildings that went down on flames. You know, uh, landlords were burning their buildings for insurance and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it was. It was a crazy time, but for me, if you ever saw the movie A Bronx, uh, Goodfellas. Okay, yeah. You know, Ray Liotta says it was a glorious time, and for me, that era was a glorious time because I got to work with and watch the greatest show on earth, 
which was the New York Yankees at that time with Billy Martin, the boss, Reggie Jackson, Bobby Mercer, Thurman Munson. I mean, it goes on and on. And these guys, because they knew where I came from, adopted me because I didn't, my father gave me up for adoption. So they honorarily adopted me as their little brother. And you would be surprised as to how many of the players and our manager did either didn't have a father or had a horrible relationship with their father. So we like depended on each other for that feeling, that moment, that motivation. You know, like we had a, a catcher on the team and our captain, his name was Thurman Munson and he died in an airplane crash. Before he died, I mean, he was our true leader. And before he died, I used to drive him to the airport so they could fly home to see the family. <clears throat> and um, the last time I saw him, like I was, like he had said to me, "Won't you fly with me?" And I hate flying. And I said, "I would, I wouldn't ever fly with you on that little plane. I don't know why you do it." Mm -hmm. And he said, "Ray, where do we come from, Ray?" He said, "He says I got to go home. I got to tuck my kids to bed. I got to be able to tell them I love them. And someday, when you have your kids, you better be the best dad ever, because of what we didn't have." You understand? Yeah, that's beautiful. And so the, these were the things that were very, very important. And I live like that today because I have four kids. And of my four kids, two of them are cops. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I used to run from the cops. I hated the cops. And look what's happened. You know, so it's incredible. Full circle. The circle of life, the cycle, man. No, 100%. And what was it like? For somebody who doesn't work with athletes or something like that, what was it like dealing with those larger than life figures in the locker room? We were talking about somebody like a Thurman Munson or any of the other guys they were close with. What is what is that truly like? Well, you know, it's funny. We had a our second baseman and in that era was a guy named Willie Randolph. And Willie Randolph, we actually played together in the Pittsburgh Pirate Organization. Okay, because we he was like a year older than me. But uh, on, on when he was on the Yankees, we used to call him teenager, again, because he was the youngest guy. And uh, today, every time he, he goes to do a documentary or something, he calls me and he says, Ray, I'm trying to remember this or I'm trying to remember that. And so I remind him. And then he says to me, how do you remember everything? He said, I, he said, I can't remember half the stuff. How do you remember? And I say to him, Willie, you got to understand, I wasn't a player. You was. So you had to prepare for Willie to be able to help the Yankees. I mean, I came into the ballpark and I sat down and strapped in to watch the greatest show on earth. Yeah. You know? And that was it, man. And that was the it was a show. Every day was a show. If you know anything about the Yankees of that time, it was a show. Did it? Do you feel like it ever, ever got old or every single night was just like the same, wow, I'm really here watching the Yankees, really here watching this live? It, the Yankees and that time and Yankee Stadium, it became my drug because I would be home and there would be a fight. And I would live, I remember there was a fight. My like my mother and my and her brother and his wife, we all in, in our house, they were there were 16 people. Wow. There were 16 people, 12 kids. And uh one uh I remember one day my uncle punches my aunt in the face, and she naturally falls down it was horrible he was an alcoholic and after breaking up the fight and everything I was hyperventilating I couldn't breathe and Steinbrenner says to had said to me that whenever you have issues at home 
come to the stadium, stay there. So I escaped the house. I jumped on the subway, went to the stadium. I couldn't breathe. I was gasping, gasping. And then as the minute I walked into the park, I could breathe again. Mm. I could breathe again. So that should answer your question. It yeah. never got old. No, I, I understand. The the a holes that worked some some of them there were a lot of a holes that worked there that I disliked, and the reason I disliked them was because they didn't appreciate what they had. Okay, whereas I took that for like gold, and you know, and and we lived in a a crazy society because certain people who were very jealous of me working there, like Steinbrenner had warned me, people are going to be jealous of you because you are my friend. And I used to say, sure. aren't they your friend? And he says, those a-holes, they, they just work for me. They're my necessary evil. You're my friend. So you're going to have to guard yourself. And those people always used to think that I was on the tape. You understand that I was, I may be cutting deals like they were, you, 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 you know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. They were and, jealous. And I, number one in my life, I never worked for money. If you know what I mean, money was not the issue for me. As long as I, like I told my wife, like I, since the boss died, I haven't had a raise. Okay. Since mm -hmm. he's died, I haven't had a raise. And she gets mad at me because she, she knows that I don't ask for one. And I say to her, did we have a meal today? Yeah. We had a rainstorm. Were you cold? Did you get wet? No. I, I said, our kids are grown up and they're doing incredible, right? She said, yeah. Then what are you complaining about? Mm. What are you complaining about? You understand? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh! I wake up every day and I see this one died, that one died, this one died. Now, if I know the person and I go to the funeral or the wake, I always look into the uh, casket to see if they put any of their money inside the casket to take it with them. And I have never seen money in the casket, so I guess they can't take it with them, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, uh, going back to the the feeling you were describing about being inside Yankee Stadium, how it was like a calming influence for you, and you said it was the greatest show on earth. I think you being upset at uh, at those other a holes, as you described them, who didn't appreciate what they had, I think that's just that passion that comes from deep inside of you as a person, as a sports fanatic. I think I feel it the same way. I, have, I agree with you, the aura and the atmosphere of a big stadium, something like a Yankee Stadium during World Series or during a playoff series, that, as a sports fan, is can be like a drug. It's just pure adrenaline. It is, as another way to describe it, it becomes a feeling, it becomes a part of you. And I felt that as well. I went to Florida State. We have college football, 90,000, almost Cedar Stadium. You can feel the energy. It's palpable. What was the biggest moment that you felt like that where you were inside Yankee Stadium and you were just, I, you, you want to say, pinch yourself, I'm dreaming, this is not happening right now? Uh, 1970, well, first off, then that first night when they gave me the uniform. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine. You know what I'm saying? I'm putting on that uniform. And did you ever see the movie The Pride of the Yankees? I, I've seen it a I while not, back, yeah. but I will watch when it. When you guys get a chance, because you know what it is, is that you're too young. When you get a chance, watch the Pride of the Yankees, okay? Or go into my Instagram. Go into my Instagram. Because when you see the Pride of the Yankees and you see a young Lou Garrett go into the locker room for the first time and he... He, he's like trying on his Yankee hat and he's looking at the mirror 
and you could see in his eyes the feeling that he had. And so that when I was in that Yankee locker room for the first time, and they gave me that uniform and the hat, and I was holding it, and I was, number one, I had tears in my eyes. And I thought of that movie, and I thought of that scene, and I thought of Gary Cooper, the actor that played Lou Gehrig. And I would later find out, because I would become friends with Gary Cooper's uh, daughter, and he had told her that that feeling, because he 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 uh, really investigated the uh, he researched Gary uh, Lou Gehrig and all of that. He said he really could feel what Lou Gehrig had to have felt like, and I felt that feeling. It was like, I mean, it was better than the first time I had sex. <laughs> I, know, I bet it was the best feeling ever. Okay. I, 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 I mean, I'm being honest. I believe you. Me. Sports, that's what I'm yeah. saying about sports. It can it can really bring yeah. this raw emotion out of you for something you know, that... And especially the Yankees. Yeah. So that, that, that was the first feeling. And then the second feeling was that getting ready for that game, we go into the dugout, right? And we had a guy on the team by the name of Bobby Mercer who was a big star then. And Bobby Mercer says to me, every, all the players were laughing and goofing about the fact that I had gotten caught doing graffiti. And so I'm in the dugout getting ready for the game to start. And Bobby Mercer says, where, uh, where are they putting you? And I said, they got me being the ball boy down the right field line because they used to rotate the bat boys. So then he said, okay, take your stool, put it down there, and then come back to me. So I took the stool, put it down, came back to Bobby. And then he says, okay, when the team runs out on the field for the start of the game, you're going to run out with us. Okay? And it was like, you're, he says, you're a Yankee now. Yeah. Yeah. And so then the organist starts playing, here come the Yankees. And he says, let's go, let's go. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's something right out of a movie. That's sure. what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, wow. It was, and, and, and I have a video that I have to find of me running on the field with players. You need to send that to me for sure. That's, that's you know, insane. I have, to, I have to find it, but I, I know it's, I have it someplace. What was the, what was the best view? Like, was it right side or uh, left field? What what was I was in the down the right field line. You're always right field? Yeah. That day I was right field. And then that was you said that was nineteen seventy seven? That World was seventy three. That was seventy three. That was seventy three, the first day that happened. Yeah, uh, and the second best day, the second best day was the day that Reggie Jackson would hit his three home runs. Yes, sir. And and so when he uh, when he hit the first home run, I, I said to Reggie, take the curtain call. And he told me no, because the fans had been rough with him that year, you know? Mm. And so then he hit the second home run. And I said, Reggie, take a curtain call now. And he, again, he said, I'm not, I told you, I'm not doing it. And so me being crazy, I said, well, when you hit the third home run, you're going to take a curtain call again, right? <laughs> and he, what did he say? What did he say? He, just like that. He says, man, you're crazy, but I'll do it. Oh, he, he knew it was coming. He knew it, the third and one was coming. It, it, nobody knew anything. It just was a magical night, the way things were happening. And because oh. in the night, it was the bottom of the eighth inning, and he was leading off the inning. And remember... He uh he hit three home runs on three pitches. Okay. It's first insane. time up, home run, second time up, home I mean, just the first pitch from the pitcher out of the park. And was that and the so, night that he um was that the night that they gave him the name Mr. October? That was, that that was, was the night that Thurman Munson gave him that name. Wow. So it started with Thurman. Yeah. And then it just caught yeah. on. And it caught on it. And if you see the video. You see me uh, after the third home run. You see me running to his ear. I was gonna say, yeah. And I say, take the curtain call. You promised. I remember. I and see so you. I see you pushing him out. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Wow. What a moment.
Uh, that, see, that's got to be insane. I, I, that's why I love sports. For moments, for, sure. for moments like that, because you're never going to forget that for the rest of your life. It's something that when you're there, it's a it's a moment that marks you. It becomes a part of you. It's yeah. crazy to say. It sounds crazy to say it's that. A personality but trait. For people who follow <laughs> sports to that nature, they they know what I'm talking about. It just becomes a feeling. So you you mentioned. Thurman was the one who gave him that nickname. I know you and Thurman were very close, and you mentioned you driving him to the airport. What was that relationship like for you with with Thurman? Um, again, he was a big brother and someone who we shared a lot of the things in common from the standpoint of our our father's situation. His father wasn't there for him, and he. Uh, and that misfortune actually helped me to accept my situation. And we talked a lot about it in our drives to the airport all the time. I mean, that, that was our alone time. So we always had that hour of just exhaling to each other. Yeah. And that was what the relationship was about. Yeah, as I, as somebody you can tell anything to is, is pretty much it's your best friend. You trust him with everything. He trusts you with everything. Must it must be a, tough to one day wake up and that person not be there? But how how much did that help you grow as a person? How did how did you overcome? And how much did it in the end with what you learned about yourself going through that situation? How much did it help you? Do you think? Number one, you never get, get over it because it's. It's over. It's forty years since he died, and I still, I still break down here and there. And when I get together with his wife, we cry together and stuff like that. But you know, he's someone that said the right things to me and supported me, and I never forget that. And that helps me all the time, all the time. And I know you used to pick up cheeseburgers for him back in the day. What was his uh? What was his go-to order? Cheeseburger and fries, two regular cheeseburgers, and French and French fries. You know that was it. He kept it simple. Sure. So that because he would, I would walk into the locker room and he would scream out, "Ray, two cheeses!" <laughs> <laughs> and I would haul ass to this McDonald's, which was right across the street. I would run right through the field, over the center field fence, through that door that was out there, across the street. I would walk in, the guy at the, at behind the counter would give me a, and I go like that, pick it in the bag, flip it to me, and I run back. And by the time I got there, it was still hot. That's awesome. That's amazing. Would he, would he, would he eat the cheeseburgers before games or was this after, yeah. before games? That was a pregame meal. Usually, like, usually this was like right after batting practice. Oh, yeah. He would take BP, come back, eat his burgers, chill out, watch TV and then game time nice so let's get into some of your books so as you know guys ray has four or is it four children's books four children's book and and the adult book not to mention uh books i've that i've written i i've actually written i probably have written now 30 books wow okay. uh five of which are are are, are published uh bestsellers no, that's awesome. And for you guys who haven't picked this up and you love the stories that Ray is sharing, there's so many amazing st stories and chronicles in here that just embody the magical experience of being living with the Yankees, being part of the Yankee organization and culture. So definitely pick that up if you guys um, want to read, have a great read. So. Also, now that we, I know you've written, I didn't know it was 30 books, or you said 20 or 30 that you've written out? 30. I've written almost 30 books now, five of which published. Five of which are published. Okay, I got it. That, what is it about writing or being an author that got you started? What, what was, did you just like writing down all the stories or did you like, did you want to share yeah. your stories with the world? I, well, what happened was, Again, in watching the movie, The Pride of the Yankees, Lou Gehrig's best friend in that movie was a reporter, you know? So when I went to work for the Yankees, I would see all the reporters and I started reading their stuff. 
And from reading their stuff, I started to uh, learn how to write like some of them. And I would like incorporate different styles from different writers. And I started writing back then and doing little articles and stuff like that. You know, I mean, if you go into the internet, you can look up. The first thing that I ever wrote was when Thurman died. It's called Five Days in August. Five Days in August. And it, for me to this day, I still consider it probably the uh, my, my best work. Though, I mean, since then, I've written thousands of articles. I mean, I, I, I write for uh, Newsmax which is out there near you guys, Newsmax Publishing, okay, uh, which is a, their major television and uh, newspaper organization. And then I write for uh, 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 New York Tastemakers. Okay. New York Tastemakers. And today I wrote a, a, actually a, a really good article on Kurt Flood because it, tomorrow is the start of Black History Month. Yeah. And uh, it's a fun story. So that that's where the writing comes from. And uh, uh, I like to think, like someone says, Ray, you're a great writer. And I always say, I'm not a great writer, but I am a great storyteller. For sure. which is, what I write is about what I have lived. If I didn't live it, I can't write it. Do you write every day? When when I get an inkling on something, because sometimes I, I'll write like two articles a day and then I won't write for two weeks and then I'll write 15 things in one week. And so, you know, you don't you never know what you're going to get from me. No, 100 percent. That's how it is being like a writer, an artist. It's like you'll just get like random spurts right. of like inspiration and then maybe like you'll hear something, it'll bring you back and then you'll just want to write it down or dive into that story whatever but um no that's that's amazing and did you always write or was it something that kind of developed as you um like were with the yankees no like i like i said my motivation came from again from that movie yeah and, um, and that the, the, like i said lou garrick's best friend was a writer and so when i got into the yankee locker room and i started meeting all the great writers of that time I learned from them. They were my teachers, my professors. Awesome. And I did ask them a lot of questions, how, you know, from the standpoint of styles and stuff, which is where my style comes from. Awesome. And I know you have a documentary in the works as well as a Broadway show. If you want to touch up on those a little bit, tell us a little bit about how that's going and maybe a little bit about, you know, when this is going to develop into something. Well, well, the documentary is is being produced by Chaz Palminteri, Chaz. Who, did, who did the movie A Bronx Tale, yeah. and uh, he's uh, he's doing this, and I'm proud of what it looks like. I'm proud of how it's coming along, and um, I think it's going to be a very interesting documentary. No, that's awesome, yeah. especially having Chaz from A Bronx Tale. That's that's yeah. definitely special, hundred percent. And then um, the the play is something that I'm really looking forward to seeing before I die. Actually, bro, plays take forever. Okay, I mean any play, especially the the big plays on Broadway like Jersey Boys and A Bronx Tale. You know, by the time they get to Broadway, they they were on the works anywhere from 10 to 20 years 100%. of preparation and stuff like that. So I know that this one and, you know, Gabe, then, you know, your father and, and um, your stepmom have been working on this for a long time. And so I appreciate their efforts, man, because... They have been champions in trying to get this thing done and done right. And I expect nothing but greatness from it. No, for sure. I'm really excited to see. I mean, I've seen firsthand how much work has been put behind the scenes into everything from development to uh, song development and script development. I've seen the changes from the drafts and it's inspiring to me, especially too, because as a writer and artist as well, 
um, like I get to see that firsthand and I get to see it helps me and like inspires me to keep going. So I, I'm definitely mm -hmm. very excited to see that. I hope well, where we pray. No, 100%. So, Ray, I know I mentioned at the start we do a lot of sports memorabilia stuff. I just want to ask you, do you have any specific relics or any specific pieces of sports memorabilia that you've collected over the years during the Yankees or anything that means a lot to you? And were the cards that big at the time, specifically sports cards? What was that like gro or growing up? I, I am... Uh really really disappointed because as a kid i collected baseball cards like crazy because we played flips and uh we well, i mean i mean there were all different game colors you know and, and so in essence i you know i had a way of i had a system that to this day i still won't tell anybody and i used to win a lot of cards and uh I used to have a lot of Mickey Mantle cards, oh. Willie Mays cards, and Roberto Clemente cards. And my mother threw them all out. You know, the standard story. Yeah, for sure. You grow up, and then she thinks, oh, he don't need these anymore. Oh, and then hurts, I go right? home one day. Sure. And I and I go to the attic, and I say, Mom, where's that box? Oh, I gave that away a long time ago. Oh, uh, Mom, you know? what are we doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I used to like tape. I used to glue cards to the wall. People yeah. used to put them in their bike spokes, all sorts of things. And I used to literally a wall. It, it became a whole wallpaper because I used all these cards. Wow. You know, not realizing what I was doing then because it wasn't like it is now. Well, yeah. It business. Now it's insane because just recently in August, the the mantle. The, the 52 Mantle did 12.6 million. No, so it's like, how could you ever imagine something like that? You know what I mean? It's not even fathomable. Yeah. I don't believe it. But all, all I know is that you guys sent me a card. Yeah, let's definitely touch up on that a little bit. You know? <laughs> did you open it beforehand? You couldn't wait? A little impatient. No, no worries. No, no, I didn't. Oh, you no, still I have it. Hold on. Let me see. What the, let's see what's in it. Oh, let's see. Hold on. Oh my, God, my God. <laughs> oh my God! He couldn't wait. So show show the people. Show show us what card what you do, have. What do we got? Wow, this is a Thurman Munson. Beautiful, beautiful. very beautiful Thurman. And, and you know the, the the craziness about this card is that he has a beard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and that was because Steinbrenner told him to sh make sure you, you can't grow a beard. You no facial hair is what he yeah. said. So Thurman purposely grew a beard. So this was because before the season or mid-season? Yeah, during the season. Wow. Yeah, that's during the season. He grew that just to just to get the owner mad. That is hilarious. That's how yeah. big of a character he was then. He was really oh, that yeah. guy that he could do that. And, and, and Steinbrenner was smart because he says, you know what, I'm going to make him the captain of the team. That way he'll have to shave. Yeah, that is funny. <laughs> No, it seemed like him and him and the boss had that connection. You know, he was. It was a, they. They had a father son relationship. Sure, and clearly it, he was really did. very well respected, and that that's just really cool to see. You know, him goofing off, but still obviously people take him super serious. He's very well respected as a captain. But I'm glad we could send you that, and you can enjoy. That Thurman Munson. I, I, I love the, the case that it comes yeah, in. Yeah, those are, right? those are that's definitely a new new age thing. We got those nice hard cases. No, they're these they're magnetic. Are really nice. They're really nice. They used to have screw downs back in the day, but they find that those over time bends the cards. So now they developed all this new technology, they're all magnetic. So that one will be in good condition for you. Well, what you guys should do is have magnetic on both sides. <laughs> on both sides that way you can take the thing off and then you can put the thing down like that yeah yeah you know that? that would be cool you know we'll let you develop this, that this is great this is great this is nice really nice no, awesome I'm glad you could have that glad you enjoy it for sure yeah no question about it yeah no question. well ray we we do appreciate you thank you so much for coming on uh before we go though i do have a little word game so i'm gonna say some names 
and then if you could give me a couple maybe descriptions or words or the or, word association yeah, yeah word association what's the first okay. word that pops in your head when i say okay. these names all right we'll go back and forth all right first billy martin my father reggie jackson my brother thurman munson my big brother don mattingly nice guy <laughs> mickey mantle first hero bobby mercer second hero <laughs> yogi berra great man george steinbrenner colossal incredible magnificent <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can go on for that um alex rodriguez sad good guy sad Derek jeter very nice person bernie williams you don't no one's nicer no one's nicer bernie's just a sweet sweet yeah bringing it to today aaron judge all right <laughs> <laughs> lastly the mole mo rivera he he was the best at what he did but not the most important mm, for sure you want to expand on that what, what, what do you mean by we, that okay i'm glad you asked me uh, we had a reliever in the 70s by the name of Sparky Lyle. In 1977 playoffs, he was our first true closer, okay? And in 1977 playoffs, the last game, uh, Billy Martin had to bring him in early because our reliever fell apart. Sparky pitched five innings. Mm. Okay, four, four and a third. I mean, he just stayed in there and he left his arm on that field, but he knew he had to. And uh, if he doesn't do that, we don't go to that World Series in 77. There is never a Mr. October. Yeah. Okay, a lot of things would not have happened if it wasn't for Sparky Lyle. Sparky Lyle taught our upcoming relievers, the slider, he taught it to Ron Guidry, who would win a Cy Young Award the following season. Uh, and it just kept on going. Pass down. Okay. And Rigetti, who was a, 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 a great reliever, who gave it to another guy, and it just kept on going. Down. Okay. And, and so, in essence, that's why I say Mo was the greatest but he wasn't the most important during the Steinbrenner era. Total, and the guy, honestly speaking, should be in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. You know, but it is what it is. Who, what do I know? Do you think? <laughs> do you think um, the cutter was developed from the slider, like from specifically? Yeah, absolutely. A absolutely, for sure. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's cool. That honestly, that's really interesting that he had that pitch, like the slider, and then other people could develop something that was based off of it and kind of make it their own so i mean what the mo throw through the cutter slider how often how often pretty often every other every pitch was and sparky lyle what he throw slider every pitch you knew that was it you're throwing your slider no 100 no that's cool we've touched on a lot of interesting experiences and honestly it was a blast to learn about a lot of the intricacies of one of the greatest organizations in sports yeah, in the we, world you <laughs> could literally sit here all day and just hear stories from you you know it's it's inspirational and it's beautiful just to have you share that straight from the goat's mouth uh, no this was fun i and number one i had no you, you, your father never told me that it was you really no he didn't well now you know <laughs> he, he told me that he told me a company. I want you to do an interview for a company, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And so what am I going to say? The man's doing my play. Am I going to say no? <laughs> sure. We appreciate it, man. It was, it was awesome. I, as a sports fanatic, not even a, a, such a fanatic of baseball, but learning more about it as i uh, been involved with the company and getting to hear stories directly from somebody who's involved with it makes me a lot more interested in the sport as well. So I just want you to know that you're helping spread the love of baseball 
to this day still amongst the community and we appreciate the energy that you bring as well we love that 100 percent. thank you i appreciate it. i love your energy and you know what and do not be afraid to to really slam these guys to get it out of them yeah thank no, you thank sure. you we appreciate it but i do appreciate right. you coming on thank we'll you talk so much soon. thank you ray see you guys later have See a good one all right all right, all right. All right.